talking cats, mass hallucinations from bread, the nearly year-long imprisonment of a toddler. Did the devil really walk through the streets of Salem, Massachusetts? Belief is a powerful thing, and in 1692, it turned deadly. The Salem witch trials had become synonymous with religious fervor and a paranoia leading to violence, but it wasn't the first time that communities were convinced that evil supernatural beings were living amongst them, or that their friends and neighbors might be working with the devil. More than 200 years before Salem, there were similar trials in Europe. As described by the European witch craze of the 14th to 17th centuries, a sociologist's perspective, these original accusation trials and executions began in the 14th century. It's believed that between 200,000 and 500,000 accused witches were executed with around 85% being women. There was something else going on here, too. Records show that some of the trials that took place weren't attempting to root out witches, but instead accused people of being another supernatural entity, werewolves. While it's believed some may have been guilty of actual crimes, the majority were scapegoats. Many of the accused were outsiders in their communities and only confessed when tortured. It's also important to note that these were not fringe actions taken by superstitious townsfolk. These trials were conducted legally by legitimate courts across the continent. There were even witch trials in America prior to Salem. As described in Connecticut Witch Trials, the first panic in the New World, there were witch trials in Connecticut as early as 1647. Connecticut's witch hunt lasted 45 years, while Salem's was only seven months. In that short time, however, Salem accused and executed more people than in all of Connecticut's decades. Many modern depictions of witch trials show those suspected of witchcraft being burned at the stake. In reality, though, none of those killed in Salem were burned but they were killed in other ways. As described by history, the myth about burnings at Salem is very likely from European witch trials. Although no one suspected of witchcraft was ever burned in Salem, it was common in Europe. In fact, it was even cemented in medieval law that witches should be burned, though many were killed in other ways and burned after death. Of the 20 people executed in Salem, 19 of them were hanged. The 20th person was executed by the hideous torture known as pressing which was a process of crushing someone to death. Several other people of Salem who had been accused of witchcraft died in jail. The people of Salem seemed to start experiencing mysterious symptoms and blaming their neighbors for them overnight. The following events have shocked and horrified people ever since. Some have looked for physical explanations for the panic. In 1976, Dr. Linda Caporeal, a behavioral scientist, proposed that the cause was actually ergotism. The fungus ergot appears on rye, causing dark purple growths. At the time, it wasn't understood to be dangerous, so it would likely still have been eaten. Eating the fungus can cause extreme hallucinations and delusions, along with convulsions and other physical symptoms. It sounds pretty straightforward, but according to the Washington Post, it might not be so simple. While some of their symptoms are similar to ergot poisoning, many of the accusers describe the same visions, making hallucinations almost impossible. The physical symptoms, like seizing up, did not get worse over time as one would expect with repeated poisoning. Instead, they seemed to react to specific stimuli, like seeing the witch or touching religious items. As horrific as the idea of dozens of people eating a toxic substance is, the likely truth is even more disturbing. Through groupthink and religious mania, normal individuals were driven to persecute and murder their friends and neighbors. It might seem absurd that otherwise ordinary people would become convinced that the people they had known for years, even their own family members, had forged pacts with the devil. But it's important to remember these events in context. For Puritans, the devil was a constant threat. As described in Connecticut Witch Trials, the first panic in the New World, Puritans, like those who lived in Salem, considered everything that happened in their lives, from floods to sour milk, to be the work of either God or the devil. In their sermons, ministers warned about the constant temptations that the devil would present to even good and holy people. In other words, the people of Salem believed that the devil was always working to pull them towards evil. As described in The New Yorker, Puritans believed that people who were tempted by the devil would become witches, entering into a pact with Satan. In fact, the second capital crime that was established for the colonies was witchcraft. Puritan faith was devout and had strict moral rules that had to be followed in every aspect of life. In a society that believed so strongly that the devil was walking among them and working evil, that also had a strict view of morality that applied to everyday life. It's not unthinkable that a moral panic would spread, and that the townsfolk would go to any lengths to stop it. Puritan faith may have been devout, but shortly before the witch trials, a new reverend arrived in Salem who was too zealous for many in the community. His name was Samuel Paris, and many have linked his preaching to the religious fervor in Salem that resulted in numerous deaths and more accusations. As described in Salem Possessed, the social origins of witchcraft, although Paris began preaching at once, he refused to officially accept the position. He continued to negotiate for a higher salary and sent highly specific terms of employment. The community came to resent Paris's demands and the negotiations 
Romans took some time. Originally, the church at Salem was welcoming to outsiders and accepted less devout members than other churches. That changed, however, when Paris made the church stricter and preached far more rigid doctrine. The community was divided between those who supported the new reverend and those who didn't. Less people went to church, and some refused to do business with him. Soon, Paris was preaching that there were devils and witches all around them. Samuel Paris had a 9-year-old daughter, Betty, and an 11-year-old niece, Abigail. As stated by history, it's believed that the girls were playing a fortune-telling game with an egg when they began acting strangely. Abigail and Betty began telling their family that they were being bitten and pinched. They babbled and spun in circles. They went alternately shaking and still. They called out during Paris's sermon. The girls were given a diagnosis, but to the people of Salem, the cause was obvious. The girls had been bewitched. <laughs> King of Ages, our Lord, our God, we beseech you to banish the diabolic powers in this body. One might think that having his own daughter beset by witches would reflect badly on Paris, but it actually raised his status. Children being attacked in Salem was seen as evidence that the people of Salem were particular enemies of the devil, and Paris would later call it humbling that God chose his family. Perhaps unsurprisingly, it didn't take long for the perceived affliction to spread. Soon, other girls and a few young women were exhibiting similar symptoms and claiming to see mysterious creatures following them. It was believed that witches were attacking them, and when the adults insisted they reveal who was attacking them, the girls agreed on three names, Sarah Good, Sarah Osborne, and Tichuba. All three women were brought to a public examination to determine if they were really witches. Tichuba, one of the women who Abigail and Betty claimed was responsible for their symptoms, was enslaved and worked for Samuel Paris and his family. It's unknown exactly why the girls targeted her, but one reason is that she had been ordered to do some peculiar baking by the Paris's next-door neighbor, Mary Sibley. Atlas Obscura explained that Sibley believed in an old folk practice for warding off evil, and that the only way to counter witchcraft effects was a different type of magic, a witch cake. When the Reverend Samuel Paris was away, Sibley ordered Tichuba to create a rye meal cake with some unusual ingredients, ashes and urine from the afflicted people. As explained by history, Sibley believed that if Tichuba fed the cake to the Paris family dog, it would tell them who the witches who had cursed the girls were. Tichuba had no choice but to follow Sibley's instructions. The dog did not reveal a name of Salem's witches, and the girls did not recover. But when Samuel Paris found out what Tichuba had done, he was furious. He believed that the witch cake was satanic, and in one of his sermons, he told the town that the cake confirmed his fears that witchcraft was rampant in Salem. Sibley herself repented and was never charged with witchcraft. Tichuba, however, who was only following Sibley's instructions, was arrested on suspicion of witchcraft. Despite her role in the story, not much is really known about Tichuba. Historians believe that she was captured and trafficked when she was still a child. She may have been an indigenous Central American who was taken to Barbados and sold to Samuel Paris as a teenager. Documents suggest that she married an enslaved man named John and that they had a daughter named Violet. According to the Smithsonian, Tichuba may have spent the majority of her time caring for Betty Paris. Paris was furious about the witch cake, and Tichuba eventually agreed to confess. As seen in the transcript of Tichuba's examination by the court, she strongly denied that she had done anything to hurt the children. When they wouldn't accept it, her story changed. Tichuba told the court that she had been forced to harm Betty and Abigail by a terrifying creature, and illustrations of her tend to reflect the idea that she too was terrified. She described something that was somewhere between a massive black hog and a dog. She described a pair of cats, one black and one red, that had demanded she obey them. She said that she and the other witches rode through the sky on sticks. Along with naming Sarah Good as a fellow witch and describing her as using her own blood to beat a strange yellow bird, she also named Sarah Osborne. She, Tichuba claimed, carried a winged creature that could shapeshift. Tichuba's incredible testimony was used as hard evidence of witchcraft and led to many deaths in Salem, but Tichuba actually survived. Sarah Good was one of the other two women that Abigail and Betty accused of witchcraft. Unlike Tichuba, she was a free woman, but she was also a vulnerable person in the community. Good was born into a relatively well-off family, but after her father died, her mother's new husband kept her and her siblings from inheriting almost all of their father's land. As stated in Salem Possessed, she married an indentured servant with a large amount of debt. When he died, she inherited all of his debts. Even after she remarried William Good, creditors continued to pursue repayment. The Goods were forced to sell their home and rely on other members of the community for food and places to sleep. Some in Salem, including Samuel Paris, considered her to be ungrateful for their charity. As noted in The Devil in the Shape of a Woman, no one spoke up for Sarah Good when she was accused of witchcraft. Her own husband joined her accuser, stating that he feared Sarah was a witch or would be one very quickly. Good had a young daughter, and she was pregnant with another child when she was taken into custody. The Puritans would not execute a pregnant woman, so they waited until she gave birth. The infant died in prison, and Good was hanged. Among the flurry of accusations that followed the first three was one against Sarah Good's daughter, the four-year-old Dorothy, who has for a long time been referred to by the incorrectly transcribed name of 
Dorcas. As told in the court transcript, several older girls, including 12-year-old Anne Putnam Jr. and teenagers Mercy Lewis and Mary Walcott, accused Dorothy of choking them, pinching them, and urging them to sign the devil's book. During the child's examination by the court, many people claimed that they were in pain whenever Dorothy happened to look at them. Dorothy was sent to prison, where she remained for just under nine months, often chained up. She survived the ordeal, but it did, of course, have a lasting impact on her. When she was 22 and the trials were long over, her father, William Good, stated that she had never fully recovered and had, ever since, been very changeable. Anne Putnam, whose family members had also accused Dorothy, would grow up to regret what she had done. When she was 29, she confessed, her admission preserved by the history of Massachusetts, that she had accused people of terrible crimes and some of those people had been killed. Putnam believed that she had been deceived by the devil and would live less than 10 years after her confession. It has been theorized that she had a chronic illness that was responsible for her early death, and it's possible that she was suffering from symptoms of this condition at the time she accused young Dorothy of hurting her. The strange events had the people of Salem convinced that there were people doing the devil's bidding in their community, which left them with the task of figuring out who among them were witches. Often, they looked to common beliefs about witches to narrow down their suspects. As described in Cry Witch, the Salem Witch Trial, 1692, it was believed that witches participated in devil-worshipping masses, spread their beliefs to their family members, and were assisted by demonic familiars. Puritans thought that when witches joined forces with the devil, they signed his book in blood. After that, it was believed that the devil would give his new servants a familiar, typically real creatures like snakes, cats, and birds, but sometimes supernatural creatures such as imps. According to legend, witches had to feed those familiars some of their own blood, and that left a mark. Puritans on a witch hunt would force accused witches to undergo a strip search for devil's marks. They would search a person's body for any place they thought a familiar might have fed. Any birthmark or freckle was suspect. Sometimes they would pierce those spots with pins, believing that witches would feel no pain. In modern times, the word witch is often used to describe women, but in Puritan Salem, witches could be men, women, and even children. Good Puritans were expected to live a simple life and never given to temptations to live in a more pleasurable way. As described in Connecticut Witch Trials, the first moral panic in the New World, Puritans felt that the devil was always trying to tempt them away from God, like in the story of Adam and Eve. They also believed that, like Eve, all women were susceptible to temptation. It's likely because of this belief that most of Salem's accused witches were women. Despite this, multiple men were accused of witchcraft in Salem, including 81-year-old Giles Corey. According to the Salem Witch Trials, a day-by-day -day chronicle of a community under siege, Corey was excommunicated from the church, but refused to stand trial for witchcraft. His refusal led to an order that he was pressed, a horrific torture that crushes the victim under rocks. The intention was to force Corey to plead innocent or guilty, but instead it killed him without a trial. It is believed that he may have accepted this extremely cruel death because it allowed his family to inherit his estate. If he had been convicted of witchcraft, it would have been seized. While Salem is often described as group hysteria, which is an accurate description in many ways, the process that the community used to accuse and execute witches was entirely legal. The court took accusations of witchcraft extremely seriously, and according to the Library of Congress, many of the convictions were based on spectral evidence. It was believed that the devil gave witches the ability to travel outside their bodies and appear to their enemies. They were even thought to be able to attack people while in this ghostly form, so the court was looking for proof that someone was able to use this type of magic. Because of this, they considered dreams and visions to be valid evidence. Spectral evidence refers to witness testimony about said dreams or visions they had. For instance, if a person had a dream that their neighbor threatened them, that dream could be used as evidence against the neighbor. However, even some who believed in witchcraft felt that using spectral evidence to get a conviction was a mistake. Cotton Mather was a famous minister who believed in witches, but he wrote to Salem's judges warning them against trusting spectral evidence. He feared that the devil might take the form of innocent people to trick people into thinking they were witches. Despite these concerns about the belief validity of dreams and visions, spectral evidence continued to be used in Salem against accused witches. With spectral evidence allowed as testimony, many members of the community came forward to tell incredible and terrifying stories about their family members, neighbors, and friends. During the examination of Sarah Cloys and Elizabeth Proctor, witnesses told the court that the women had come to them many times, grabbing, pinching, and biting. In the deposition of John Allen versus Susanna Martin, Allen claimed that he had attempted to throw Martin into a brook, but she escaped by flying away. In the deposition of Thomas Bailey versus John Willard, Bailey said that he had gone looking for Willard because he had heard that he was beating his wife. As Bailey approached, he claimed he heard the terrifying sounds of evil spirits. The Smithsonian says that if neighbors and former friends began lying about someone and saying they were in league with the devil, sometimes the safest thing for the accused witch to do was to agree and ask forgiveness. The hairy beast stood next to them on two legs. I signed its book. 
there was no way for an accused person to get a fair trial. The accused had to represent themselves with no help. The friends and family members were often afraid to speak out in case the community decided that they were witches too. As well as allowing dreams and visions as evidence against them, they were questioned in front of an audience. And many in the audience would start screaming and writhing in pain when the accused looked at them, which was also considered evidence that they were guilty. People who insisted that they were innocent and had never performed evil magic to hurt anyone were often punished harshly or killed. If the accused was willing to pretend that they were witches and repent, asking for forgiveness, they were generally allowed to go free because Puritans believed that God would punish them as they deserved. Minister Samuel Paris's niece Abigail had an explanation for the outbreak town's former minister, George Burroughs. As described in Salem Possessed, Burroughs was no longer in Salem, but that didn't stop the community from charging him with witchcraft. Abigail officially charged Burroughs with being the first in Salem to serve the devil and to convert others to the diabolic cause. Burroughs now lived in Maine, but he was brought back to Salem to stand trial, and it was there that he was hanged. At the time, it was believed that because witches had turned away from God, they were unable to correctly say prayers. Before he was hanged, Burroughs said the Lord's Prayer. The townsfolk, who had gathered to watch the execution, started to doubt that he was actually a witch. But doubt was not enough to save him from the hangman's noose. John Proctor is the protagonist of the famous Arthur Miller play The Crucible, but he was also a real man executed for witchcraft in Salem. As stated in The Crucible of History, Arthur Miller's John Proctor, Miller stated that he had fictionalized Proctor and his wife more than any of the other characters. I have given you my soul, leave me my name! Unlike his depiction in the famous play as a young laborer, Proctor was actually a wealthy man, known for speaking his mind, in his 60s when he was accused. From the first accusations, Proctor argued that Betty, Abigail, and the others were lying. It is believed that he also beat his servant Mary when she started claiming that she was afflicted by witches. When Proctor's wife was accused, he argued that she was innocent, leading others in Salem to believe he was also in league with the devil. Soon, there were multiple accusations against Proctor. Some, including Ann Putnam, accused Proctor of appearing to them as an apparition pinching and choking them and trying to force them to sign the devil's book. One woman accused him of crushing her and forcing her to drink blood before vanishing into thin air. Proctor was the first man accused of witchcraft in Salem, and according to the Smithsonian, he was executed just below the infamous Gallows Hill. The majority of those accused of witchcraft in Salem were killed on a ledge below Gallows Hill. There were three mass executions under Gallows Hill, and a total of 19 people were murdered there. Those who were convicted in the Salem witch trials were brought to what is now known as Proctor's Ledge and hanged from the trees. After they were killed, the bodies were dropped off the ledge in a spot simply known as the Crevice. Although they were thrown there without ceremony, the families of those killed were known to secretly come to the crevice in the middle of the night to collect their loved ones' bodies. Where they were ultimately buried is unknown. In 2017, a monument was built on Gallows Hill honoring those who had been killed there. It was more difficult to speak out against the trials from inside the village, as John Proctor learned. It's impossible to say how many of the people in Salem who went along with the trials actually believed those they executed were guilty, and how many were afraid that they would be targeted if they resisted. But after the trials ended, and there was less risk of being accused of witchcraft, many more Salem residents condemned what had been done. As noted by National Geographic, when Governor Phipps' wife was accused of witchcraft, he put a stop to the trials. Phipps prevented the use of spectral evidence, which made it almost impossible to convict someone on witchcraft charges. He ultimately pardoned all the accused witches in prison, and in time, some of the victims' families were offered compensation. As soon as the threat of violence had decreased, more people spoke out against Reverend Samuel Paris. The church records show that many stopped going to church, citing Paris's involvement with the trials and saying that they felt unsafe attending. Paris would eventually ask for forgiveness from the congregation. While they continued to have many supporters, there were vocal critics. It is believed that three years after the trials ended, he was finally forced to leave the Salem Parish.